Well, that was exceedingly generous. I, I appreciate it. And all um, true. All uh, true. Hardly. We have a really uh, good panel to wind up uh, the morning. And uh, what we're going to focus on is digital health. And it, it's, um, as you probably know, there's a lot of froth, a lot of uh, turmoil in the area of, of digital health. How can we uh, use advanced technologies to, to help monitor chronic health conditions? And we have three uh, terrific presentations focusing on different disease areas, uh, different health areas. And, and my hope for this session is that you'll wind up getting at least a feeling for uh, where digital health is going. It's been a scrappy start, to be honest. We had a lot of technology push innovation, a lot of ready, fire, aim uh, innovation where uh, savvy tech folks uh, tried to bring technologies for monitoring uh, into health and by and large didn't have a clear focus on what the real clinical need, uh, what the real wellness need was. And happily we're uh, evolving past that and we're getting into some meaningful examples of digital health technologies. We have three of those uh, here to review this morning. I'm gonna start out by introducing David Moss, who's a professor of pediatrics uh, in endocrinology here, chief of the pediatric endocrinology uh, division. David uh, trained in New Mexico uh, and then fellowship at the University of Colorado, got his PhD in analytic health sciences and epidemiology in Colorado. Uh, we lured him out here to uh, run the pediatric endocrinology division. He is a specialist in diabetes and is going to set the context for us on the intersection of, of new technology monitoring uh, techniques in diabetes. So David, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, let's see, get the slides up. All right. So uh, again, thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity to speak and to share some of the work that we're doing at Stanford, uh, specifically with artificial pancreas. And so I just wanted to start with a few slides on some of the basics of type 1 diabetes just to get us all on the same page. Uh, so type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. It leads to destruction of uh, the beta cells, which make insulin. It affects about 1.5 million people in the US, and by the age of 18 in the US, about one in 300 children have type 1 diabetes. So as a result of not having uh, enough uh, ability to make insulin, uh, well, why is insulin so important? Well, it allows sugar to pass from uh, the blood into the cells where it can be used for energy. Insulin also turns off glucose production in the liver. And it also then shuts down uh, fat breakdown. And so you see here what that physiology looks like. And this is from one of our uh, education books that uh, features the pink panther. And in the next slide, what we see is what happens in the absence of insulin. And so this is what our patients look like when they come in uh, with the unhappy uh, pink panther there. Without insulin in their body, there's an accumulation uh, excess of glucose that then gets passed uh, in the urine. So patients have poly. Uh, urea, polydipsia, weight loss. There's also breakdown of fat um, that releases ketones and patients can get very sick. So in principle, the treatment for type 1 diabetes is very simple. We need to replace insulin in the way that the body uh, is not able to make it. However, in practice, that's been a very challenging and difficult and burdensome task for our families where we would typically ask them to do finger sticks, poke their fingers, check their blood glucose six to 10 times a day. They'd need to take insulin, both a base insulin, uh, because the body always needs some insulin in their system, and then bolus insulin uh, or rapid acting insulin when they eat food to cover the challenge of, uh, of those carbohydrates in the system. They also have to be very attentive to their diet as well as exercise, which can cause fluctuations in their glucose, um, but yet is a very important part of, of a healthy uh, life. So, Fortunately, we have some ways to measure how we're doing. We have a measurement called a hemoglobin A1C. This gives us an idea of how uh, glucose uh, control has been over the past three months. And these are data from the type 1 diabetes exchange, almost 20,000 patients in the US. And you'll see the display here of the A1C values across the lifespan from about two years to about 80 years of age. 
And uh, you'll see then that this curve is much too high in children and adolescents and young adults. These are the patients that we're taking care of in our clinic, and they're much above what the A1C targets are set by uh, the American Diabetes Association. And this is still uh, the case more than 25 years after a study which showed us uh, the importance of tight glucose control. And why is glucose control important? Because we know that as that A1C increases, that then there is an increase in some of the vascular damage that diabetes does, both to the eyes, the kidneys, the nerves, and also to the heart and cardiovascular system. So it's very important that we have good glucose control. And that raises the question then, how can diabetes technology help? How can this help us improve glucose control with the goal of having better health outcomes? How can diabetes technology decrease the burden of care and lead to better quality of life? So that's what we're going to talk about now. One of my mentors, uh, Dr. Chase, uh, Peter Chase, who wrote that Pink Panther education book, um, talks about the three errors of glucose monitoring. Uh, the first being a very crude way to measure uh, what, how much urine, uh, how much sugar is being passed in the urine, then progress to ability to do finger pokes with glucose meters and know a, t a point in time glucose measurement. And then in the last uh, decade or so, we've had continuous glucose monitors or CGMs, which are able to provide us readings on glucoses every five minutes and provide a lot more information and raise the opportunity then to have uh, a mechanical uh, artificial pancreas, which we will talk about. Now, not only has there been evolution in how we measure glucose, but there's also been evolution in how insulin is delivered. Um, the first uh, example there is a proof of concept, but it did not do well commercially, um, a backpack uh, pump system. Uh, the second system, if you showed that to our patients now, they would wonder what exactly that is. Um, affectionately referred to as the old blue brick, and uh, it did work, and there were patients who, who really benefited from that. But now, 20 to 30 years later from that, uh, we have these much more sophisticated devices um, that are shown in the right panel, just some of those. So, as we've had progress in, in uh, diabetes technology, I try to give the example to our families that there's also been progress in, in technology, and the cell phone example really rings uh, home to people, and, and these are already outdated slides. If you show that uh, slide from uh, uh, Wall Street with that big clunky phone to our adolescents now, they're not exactly sure what he's holding to his ear. Um, and uh, yet many of us remember what a breakthrough uh, those types of phones were. And remember, it's only been about 10 years since we've had an iPhone. So uh, also to remember then that with these uh, initial first-generation systems that we do have a long way to go to make them as good as we would like to. So uh, things are moving. Things are moving fast, but they're not moving as fast as we would like. And so with these continuous glucose monitors, uh, there has been a, a, a parent-driven development uh, in the past few years, a group called Night Scout, where they hacked into these CGM systems and were able to get the data up to the cloud and then down to their cell phones so that they could uh, remotely monitor their children, uh, say if they were in school or away from them, to know what was going on. This then, I, I believe, accelerated FDA approval of this technology, and now this is a standard part of how these continuous glucose monitor systems work. And uh, now these are widely used by, by parents um, and our, our children that we take care of uh, in schools. Um, their parents are able to follow what their glucose is doing. That can be very reassuring, um, but it also can raise uh, some, some issues as well. So what, when we talk about the artificial pancreas, what do I mean? Well, these are a combination of, of three things. One is the insulin pump. As I showed you, we've had these available for 20 to 30 years. In the last decade, there's been increasing uh, development and refinement of the glucose sensors, which you see here. And then these glucose sensors beam the information to the pump, which now is uh, smart enough and has an algorithm in it that can help dose the insulin to remove some of that burden that's placed on patients and families. So why do we need this? Well, here's a slide from Dr. Uh, Bruce Buckingham, and we'll hear more from him later. I have a video to show in, in a few minutes. But if you orient yourself to the top panel and the figure, you'll see the glucose values uh, on the left. And uh, this is from a 17-year-old uh, patient um, who was, uh, had an excellent A1C of 6.2%. And you'll see that when she went to bed or at midnight, her glucose was 
uh, in uh, above 100, and then you'll see that it decreased um, steadily overnight, and you'll see here in this lower area that indeed her CGM was alarming, um, and like many 17-year-olds, she slept through this. Unfortunately, after about two and a half hours of having this low blood sugar, she had a seizure. So this CGM was not connected to, uh, to the pump. They weren't talking. And what was the pump doing at the same time? It was continuing to deliver that preset amount of insulin when what we would have liked it to have done is to have been smart enough to turn off insulin because she was going low and not to continue to pump insulin into a child who was having hypoglycemia. So that leads us then to where we're at now. And these are data, again, in the top panel, um, we see um, the uh, CGM uh, sensor glucose data, and we see a comparison between open loop in the uh, black and then a closed loop control in the uh, red. And what you'll see is that overnight with closed loop control, that there is a decrease in the mean glucose, but also importantly, a decrease in the variability so that people are waking up at lower levels and with less variability. How is this achieved? Well, let's again look at the bottom panel and see what happens with insulin delivery. And again, with the black and the hatched line, you see that there's a preset amount of insulin. There's very little variability, whereas with the closed loop control, there's variability in insulin delivery to reduce variability in glucose, which is what we want. So this has been a, a big innovation. Um, and again, how does this work? Well, as the glucose is going up, we want the system to give more insulin. As the glucose is going down, we want it to give less insulin or even to stop giving insulin until the glucose has come back up. So these are our programs that have been in development for 10 to 15 years. Um, and I'm going to feature now some of the work from the Stanford team led by uh, Dr. Bruce Buckingham, um, who's been one of the leaders nationally and internationally in this field over the past 15 years and was there uh, really at the start in the development of the conceptualization of, of these systems. Um, and then also Dr. Leah Eklaspor, who's uh, one of our instructors. And then we have a big team of, of people um, who uh, uh, work uh, very hard on all of these studies um, and with the families and the patients. So uh, one of the first, uh, uh, well, one of the big studies in our field was um, this uh, uh, paper that came out in JAMA about a year and a half ago, and it led to then the first FDA approval um, for Medtronic's artificial pancreas device. This is a first generation system. It's out. Uh, Dr. Buckingham uh, and team played a big role in, in getting this uh, not only developed, but doing the preliminary studies and getting this to market um, so that now patients uh, in the US are benefiting from this. But we'll also work with other, other teams, and, and Dr. Buckingham uh, works uh, with pretty much every, every system, every company um, that's out there. Here's uh, the tandem system, which is slightly different. We believe that our patients, uh, we want them to have a broad range of systems to choose from and trying to work with uh, as many uh, in researchers and uh, uh, industry as we can so that our patients do have different opportunities um, as we don't think one size will fit all. Um, there's another system called the bionic pancreas um, developed in Boston. This consists not only of insulin delivery, but also includes glucagon. Um, glucagon is the hormone that raises blood sugars. And so this is a system that's in development. Um, and as you see in this slide, just showing that um, in these initial studies uh, that there have been reductions both in the mean glucose but also a reduction in the amount of hypoglycemia that these patients have as well. So this is a, another system in development. Um, these are recent data that Dr. Uh, Buckingham and Ecclespor showed at the uh, recent uh, international meeting, uh, ATTD meeting in Vienna, um, with another system, a patch pump uh, from Omnipod uh, Insulet that showed, again, that these systems do very well, they're safe, and they reduce uh, glucose variability as well as hypoglycemia. So, I really like this slide, uh, again, featuring uh, both Dr. Buckingham and then Dr. Corey Hood, who is one of our pediatric uh, diabetes psychologists. And uh, he is uh, the lead for the harmonization of the data around user experience and the psychosocial components of these four pivotal NIH studies. Um, 
uh, and we're the only center at Stanford who's involved um, in all four of these NIH-funded studies, um, which is uh, a, a, a big deal and testament to the uh, hard work of, of Drs. Buckingham and, and Hood. So uh, in this slide, uh, just featuring some of the work of, of Dr. Hood and Dr. Uh, Diana Naranjo, um, that it's not only to develop the, the systems, um, but how then do you get an adolescent to wear these systems and to have it be effective. Um, you can imagine that if you're an uh, adolescent, the last thing you want is something on your body that makes you stand out. You don't want to have something that's beeping. You don't want to have something that makes you different from your colleagues. So it's very important now as these systems have been developed is how do we make, help people use these successfully. And so they've uh, got a, a variety of models, um, theoretic models that uh, translate into practice then that with these devices you need to have realistic expectations, um, you need to give the patients problem solving skills so that this can then translate to increased time of having glucose in range and also to have a reduced cognitive burden. These, if these systems cause you to uh, require more work, uh, they're probably not going to be widely adopted. And so to do that, we need to reverse this slide. We need to decrease the burden and increase the support so that that uh, equation is different. So um, I'm going to show a couple of slides here and then uh, move on to a video. This is from, uh, as uh, Dr. Yock said, I, I came from uh, Colorado the last uh, 13 years. Um, and in the bottom corner there was one of my mentors, Dr. Chase, in the 80s, he would take um, busloads of children with type 1 diabetes up to the mountains to go ski. Um, Imagine taking your own children up to ski. Now imagine taking a busload of children up to ski. Now imagine taking them up and checking their blood sugar. Um, and this was when uh, glucose meters were just coming out. So we decided that we would take that model and then uh, put a uh, research study on to test these artificial pancreas systems to see how they would do. Um, and we were pleased to uh, have this published um, in the past uh, few months um, in diabetes care, showing that indeed these systems uh, were able to, to function uh, with the challenge of, of the ski environment, and the kids had a great deal of fun. So we decided then uh, to join uh, with our colleagues in Virginia and Colorado and now perform this at Stanford, and we had this scheduled for a month ago and there was a three to four foot blizzard in Tahoe. So we canceled that, uh, but fortunately we were able to reschedule um, for last weekend, and so the kids really had a lot of fun. The parents got a break and knew that their children were being well looked after. The data from this study will also help inform uh, the FDA submission, um, and also it's going to help us understand better how, to, how these systems work with cold, with altitude, and with extreme exercise. And importantly, again, the kids really have fun, which we'll see um, in this next slide. William was diagnosed when he was in second grade, and he's in sixth grade now. So really not a long time. And I just feel like even in that period, things have changed so much. I'm actually really grateful, you know, seeing the kids getting together yesterday and settling in. And I haven't seen William that excited about anything in a really long time. It was pretty overwhelming. There were a lot of people, there were kids, nobody really knew anybody really well. There were needles being poked and, you know, and. And it was, it, instead of being intimidated by that, I think he was really like sort of revved up by that. He was super excited. It was really fun to see that. You never know what it is that's gonna make your kids feel that way. And I'm, I'm really grateful that he's having this experience. In the last few years, we've seen a commercial development of a closed loop system, which is now available to children. We are now testing that last week on two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and four-year-olds. A really amazing event. And today, we're up at a ski camp. We're testing kids on a closed-loop system in the mountains while they're skiing in the cold. We have tested it in every different type of environment. There are a whole set of systems coming out that we've been working with, from Medtronic to Tandem to um, Insulet, which makes a little pod pump and with the University of Virginia. And our goal is to really get rid of the burden of diabetes.
All right, so uh, it, it was a lot of fun, a lot of work. Our team um, really uh, went uh, above and beyond. I'd also like to acknowledge Grant, um, who spent uh, two days up uh, taking the film for that and, and on very short notice putting together a very nice video. So we really appreciate that, Grant. Um, so where, where are things going? And this is from a paper that one of our, uh, our junior faculty, uh, Priya Prahalad, uh, published in Diabetic Medicine. Um, so what is the future of, of the uh, pediatric diabetes in the digital clinic? Well, certainly there will be more diabetes technology to deliver insulin, um, to uh, give us readings on on glucose and to automate this and simplify things. PROs or patient reported outcomes are in incredibly important. We're also expanding our telehealth and our teleeducation program. There's tremendous opportunities uh, with uh, benchmarking, with quality improvement, electronic medical records, and the amount of data that we get from these systems uh, is tremendous and I think a great opportunity um, for uh, discovery. And then the partnerships, um, both academic and industry, but then also between the providers and the patients and, uh, and, and family, um, that there's a lot to do to make uh, our care better and reduce the burden. Uh, just a, a brief plug in my last couple of slides here for uh, one of the pilot and feasibility grants um, that the Diabetes Research Center has recently funded. Um, Dr. Diana Naranjo is uh, using virtual reality to try to break down some of these barriers um, that children have or adolescents can have to using these diabetes technologies. And um, it's really a, a, an interesting project and we'll see um, where this goes. But um, you know, Stanford is a place where innovation happens and, uh, and particularly uh, the work being done in, in diabetes and technology. And so just a brief plug again for for the uh, Stanford Diabetes Research Center. We, uh, just in the past year, under the leadership of Dr. Sung Kim, got a P30 grant, which um, puts us uh, in one of the 16 uh, NIH-funded uh, diabetes research centers. So that was a, a big accomplishment. And Dr. Karen uh, Kocha-Lakota is um, the program manager and, and in the audience as well. So if you want to find out more about diabetes research, uh, you can go to our website and, and connect with us. Um, so with that, I'd just like to conclude and thank everyone for their attention. David, that was terrific. Uh, it was especially good that you brought the video. Uh, and and uh, it occurs to me that the field really needs more extensive studies. There's surfing, there's, you know, water skiing, there's all, you know. So, so uh, that, that's your charge. Um, please uh, keep track of your questions for David. We'll, we'll circle back at the end of the three presentations with a question uh, session. I'd like to introduce Carlos Mila now, who is the director of the Stanford uh, Cystic Fibrosis Center. Uh, Carlos began his medical training in Peru, uh, then uh, SUNY uh, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, then the University of Minnesota uh, came here. He is the Crandall Endowed Scholar in Pediatric Pulmonary Medicine uh, and is going to talk uh, uh, to us a little bit about uh, a different area and in particular looking at uh, ways of, from uh, sweat, understanding what's going on metabolically. So please. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me a few minutes to try to condense eight years of research in just uh, 20 minutes. Um, and I'd like to start, you heard early on that CF is making a lot of noise. Sorry, John, you pick on the wrong disease. Uh, but it, I, I think it's for a number of reasons. You know, not only is much more frequent, uh, I think the incidence is 10 times in California as opposed to SMA. But I think we've helped to transform the field of rare and genetic disorders uh, when it comes to you know, all the advances that we're doing to help our patients. And one of the things where we spent a lot of time was on the diagnostics and the detection of the disease, which we, as you'll see later, have been transforming into not just diagnostics, but also means of doing a monitoring of patient responses to very novel treatments. Now, everybody has been showing uh, things in the medical literature that were lost. I think I'm gonna break the record. Because the very first description of how to use sweat as a diagnostic tool goes down to uh, 1606. Uh, this is a medical textbook by uh, Juan Alonso de los Ruizes that was uh, talking about, uh, and this was just uh, taken from what the old wives' tales were, that you will recognize the bewitch, and here bewitching meant you know, things that were not really well understood, you know, that really did not go along with what nature will predict. That was either magic or witching. But he said, you, know, you will recognize the bewitch by touching their forehead and then noting a salty taste in your fingers. And what he meant is that you know, the baby that they, will that they will taste salt in their sweat was doomed to die. 
You know, the disease is cystic fibrosis. However, it took 350 years until there was a connection between the disease cystic fibrosis and what was already recognized down in the um, 16th century. And by the way, the translation of the book nowadays will be something along the lines of what to expect when you're expecting. And the interesting thing is that, you know, the, this is chapter 10, it's the last chapter, which is the thickest part of a book, because most of the book is dedicated to what to do with the baby, not so much what to do with the pregnant lady. But anyway, so if you push fast forward, again, three centuries, then we get to um, cystic fibrosis. I'm not going to elaborate much on the disease, because most of the research I'm going to describe is how we've been focusing on using sweat as a means of uh, not just detecting disease, but also being able to monitor different conditions. And we all sweat. You know, we are um, only humans and horses sweat effectively for thermal regulation. So it's the way in which you dissipate heat, particularly when you're running on a hot day, that's your only means of being able to dissipate heat. Otherwise, you'll experience heat prostration immediately. Um, and it's under very tight regulation. There are thermosensitive neurons in the preoptic region of the hypothalamus that are controlling the rate of uh, um, sweat secretion. Because if you don't do it right, you can get dehydrated and get uh, not just uh, water loss, but also very substantial uh, salt loss, which is the problem in cystic fibrosis. And we sweat a lot. You know, on a regular day, you can sweat up to two to four liters, depending on what part of the uh, world you're in. Obviously, uh, around the equator is a much larger value than uh, during winter months in the northern hemisphere. Now, um, I, I'm going to save you a lot of work that we've done over the last uh, few years trying to understand how is it that the sweat gland does what it does. It's like a mini kidney, actually, um, and it has a coil at the bottom under the dermal area where all of the secretion happens. But then there's a number of um, both physical and chemical processes that go on that are going to lead to the secretion, um, and not just in terms of the composition of the sweat, but also in terms of the rate at which the sweat is coming out of the glands. And that's very tightly regulated. And it's very important to mention that in normal individuals, 99% of the sweat is water. Okay? But we're very interested, and most of the work that we're doing is on that 1%, because that's where all the gold nuggets are. This is what the sweat gland will look like on a biopsy. And when it relates to cystic fibrosis, just to put it in very simple terms, under cholinergic stimulation, there's going to be secretion of sweat. And that secretion is basically isotonic fluid. I mean, from plasma, you're just filtering out the protein and letting the water and electrolytes and other components go into the sweat duct. And then up the ducts, um, the sweat is going to be coming out, getting ready to be uh, secreted. But there is a very active uh, and very dynamic process by which electrolytes are pulled back. And that's what leads, meaning there's a very rapid con uh, concentration towards the plasma side so that you have um, a very hypotonic, meaning almost water um, solution that comes out uh, out of the sweat glands. Now, this also implies that the sweat gland is very highly innervated and also very richly vascularized. So not only you have very um, effective secretion, but also very rapid and very effective, highly effective uh, reabsorption of electrolytes, which is rate dependent. Now, Paul Quinton, which looks here in very commanding uh, position, was the one that was able to crack the mystery of 300 years of why is it that these babies taste salty. And he was able to figure out, and this is one of his own glands, uh, Paul happens to have cystic fibrosis, so a lot of his research has been based on his own personal interest in the disease, obviously, and he's a physiologist. But he was able to uh, demonstrate that the main problem is that there is an impermeability to the reabsorption of chloride on the duct, and particularly as it gets closer to the surface of the skin. And that's the primary defect in cystic fibrosis. And now we know that people that have a defect on their cystic fibrosis gene, that's sort of the common um, physiologic phenomenon that we see across patients, that they have this inability to reabsorb chloride. And that leads to a high content of uh, salt. Now, you push fast forward, and this is one of many studies that we've done over the last uh, eight years to advance new generation therapies, as we call, for cystic fibrosis. And these are treatments that are targeting the main defect, the basic defect. We can restore protein function and then uh, be of benefit to patients. And this is an observation that we did on a study that we published last year. I happened to uh, have the good fortune of um, uh, being the lead site for this study and the PI for it. We were able to demonstrate on children not only that we were able to see clinical benefit, but along with that, we saw, and this was the first time this was reported, 
on children that were homozygote for uh, the most uh, common gene mutation that we see on CF patients, a very rapid uh, improvement in their sweat chloride values. Not necessarily close to what we'll see in a normal individual, but a very significant uh, uh, change in their ability to retain uh, chloride. Um, and this effect was uh, fairly substantial and sustained over time. Now, not only that give us good proof of uh, concept in the sense that we have a mechanism behind, meaning the biological effect was tied to a clinical effect, but it also gives us a little bit of a red flag that maybe we're coming with a good biomarker for future, not just therapeutic development, but also for patient monitoring as to when is it that we can tell if someone is really going to benefit from an uh, intervention. Now, this is the way the sweat chloride testing has been done since the 1950s when it was first described. So we've been sort of stuck for the last 60 years with exactly the same methodology. If you go to Stanford Hospital right now, this is the way the test is done. This is a baby's arm. It's wrapped uh, so that there are two electrodes there so we can do electrophoresis for an agonist, for a cholinergic agonist, and pilocarpine is a drug that is frequently used. And then we'll place either a ghost pad or a filter paper or one of these um, capillary coils to try to collect the sweat that is coming out. And this is one of the frustrations, particularly when you work with small babies. You're not always going to be able to uh, collect enough sweat to be able to do the next step, which is the measurement. So it's a test that takes several steps and is challenging to complete. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get better at this. Because uh, in 2007, California gave green light to doing newborn screening for cystic fibrosis, which meant we're going to now start to uh, face the challenge of testing two-week-old to two, four-week-old four babies that needed this testing. And oftentimes, that's the most challenging patient population to get enough sweat. So we spent a lot of time trying to first understand what goes into this secretory rate and what is the best way to get uh, fairly reliable stimulation. And for this, we collaborated with Jeff Wine, uh, who invented basically a method in which we can see each of the single glands as they are secreting. And they give us a lot of understanding as to what goes into a secretory rate and how important that is, particularly when it comes to making good interpretation of your electrolyte values. Because we know that there's going to be some influence of the secretory rate. A low rate is not going to give you the same type of um, uh, electrolyte concentration as a high secretory rate. And then we use all this information to think, okay, if we want to make a better test, what are going to be some of the things that we need to keep in mind as to what will make it a really good test? And then um, we lay out some goals for this project. And first of all, we wanted to have like a one package takes it all, you know, like a mini lab on the patient, so to speak, where we will be doing trying to tie together both the stimulation so we can get enough sweat, and at the same time do in situ in real time the actual measurement of the electrolytes. Because we're not going to go into all the nuances that go into trying to measure chloride in any uh, uh, body fluid. Um, first of all, we wanted to see if we could miniaturize, because the most challenging thing for the lab is how to measure the chloride. It's done through what we call coulometric titration, which is not easy. So first we wanted to see if, we, if there would be a good way in which we could actually develop sensors that will, on the little bit of sweat that is coming out, be able to pick up on the signals um, that will represent the electrolyte concentration. And for this, uh, we started collaborating with the um, Ali Jabay lab at Berkeley. Uh, Sam, Emma Mijenat, and Yu Gao were the ones that lead this project. And basically, we were able to develop a, and here, um, there. So this was the critical piece right here, which was the sen sensor array, as we call it. And those were the um, things that were going to measure the electrolytes for us. And most of the work were in trying to make sure that the sensors were accurate and have a good response time, as we call it, as well as making sure that there was a good way to calibrate what the sensors were reading, because these are electrical signals that are being generated. And this is sort of what our first generation device looked like. But on the proof of concept studies, what we were able to show is that if the electrodes were coming into contact with sweat, we were able to very accurately uh, identify the concentration of the different um, analytes of interest here. And one of the additional goals that we set for this was to move it away from the lab and being able to have the signals that were detected by the sensor be just put up on the cloud so that we could with an Android phone, because Android phones thinking uh, uh, um, on a big scale, we wanted to make this a global test so I could go to Africa and be able to do sweat testing on kids, right? 
and Androids are much more, uh, I think it's three to one in terms of number of uh, Android phones to iPhones. So knowing that we were able to measure the signals of interest, our next step was to, well, how can we make then this MARI to a uh, stimulator so that we can generate very rapid sweating that the sensors will pick up. So Sam came up with the idea and we spent some time designing this uh, of uh, creating a stimulator that will uh, be in tandem with, with the sensor array. And this is what the first generation device look like. And again, you have the um, circuitry and these are flexible circuit boards which are fairly cheap to make nowadays as well as an electrode array, and in real time it looked like this. So our sensors are under a Tegadern patch. They're uh, not just fairly flexible, very thin. It almost looks like foil. Um, and um, the command center and the Bluetooth is somewhere in there. I think it's the smallest of all the uh, circuits in there. And this has uh, come down in size even more in our uh, next iteration of devices. And to be quick, we're able to show that, you know, we're able to uh, very reliably introduce, induce very rapid onset sweat secretion. You see, it doesn't take too long for the sweat secretion to uh, start and to also generate very good volumes of sweat for the amount that we need for the sensor. Because that's one of the limits nowadays with obtaining an accurate test, meaning a reliable test in the clinic, that you need to generate at least 20 microliters of sweat. And that's a fairly good amount uh, taking into account the area that we need to stimulate. And not only that, but we could repeatedly, and this is the same subject, after a few minutes, if we turn it on again, we again are inducing good sweat. So we have very good response of the uh, glands to the device. And then the next thing, and this was the most satisfying piece, was that we were able to show that it was very sensitive to the electrolyte concentrations, and it gave us a very steady and nice signal, meaning our signal is not dying out or deteriorating over time. And um, as part of the study, we obviously compare, you know, healthy subjects to people with CF, and we're able to show how the device not only was very nicely separating healthy from uh, CF subjects, but at the same time showing us very good correlation between what we knew in the CF and the healthy subjects in terms of the test done um, through the routine uh, lab test. Now, as we were doing all this, the revolution of wearables came around. I think the uh, iWatch has really generated a lot of interest on uh, trying to develop uh, devices and uh, technologies and apps particularly that can help to uh, bring to the person level measuring all sorts of variables. And there have been a number of other groups that have been looking into what else could you exploit by uh, being able to induce sweating. And here's an example. This is a group in La Jolla that uh, what they're doing here, BAC stands for blood alcohol. What they're doing is a, a device that looks fairly similar to uh, what we're doing, but the sensors are, are, are basically tuned to detection of alcohol. And the idea here is that you go to a party, you put your patch on, and it's gonna beep on your iPhone when you've come a little too close to the <laughs> limit. And not only that, now that, not only you have smartphones, but also smart cars, it will not let your car turn on if you're already past the limit. So that's where the technology is um, at nowadays. So there's been a little bit of a revolution now because they, as we were working on this, and particularly when we show our first proof of concept uh, results, there's been an explosion of what I like to call now the sweatomics field. You know, people call me all the time coming up with ideas of measuring many different things, from proteins to small molecules and even to drugs. You could do a number of, uh, not just alcohol, but opioids, for example, you could monitor through uh, sweating. Um, so we wanted to really take it to the next level and think about, well, it's a good diagnostic, but can we take it to the next level? And not just to diagnostics, we're more taking into account our clinical trials showing that sweat chloride can be a powerful biomarker. And can we use it also for monitoring? And not just for monitoring, but to do it in real time and over prolonged periods of time. So our next generation devices are looking at uh, inducing sweat periodically, either programmed or on demand, meaning I can program through my iPhone the patch that I put on the patient to send me a signal of what their sweat chloride level looks like at midnight. You know, because most of the drugs that patients are taking nowadays are two times a day, which means you need to take a pill at bedtime, which means I should be able to see an effect sometime uh, later in the night. Uh, but we're also uh, creating arrays of sensors where we can measure a number of variables. And not just analytes, but also things like temperature or um, sweat rate or uh, pH. Um, because with this, we think that we can make a very nice profile of your metabolic state and things that have to do with perfusion, 
which will be very important in ICUs, for example, we think that by integrating the right level of variables and doing the right modeling, we're spending a lot of time on the bio modeling, really, we could probably give an alert as to when is it that someone's perfusion is not going as good and probably before your blood pressure will tell you that. Or another twist to this, remember I said the glands are very highly vascularized but also very highly innervated, is drug toxicities. First example I can cite is chemotherapy. You know, when people get chemotherapy, a, a side effect for many of the different uh, drugs that you use is uh, neurotoxicity. And the sweat glands lose innervation, the autonomic uh, system particularly, is one of the ones that tends to take the first hit. So you can barely quickly be able to detect when someone is experiencing a, a deleterious effect. Um, and we also wanted to uh, work in a way in which it will calibrate itself, meaning the, the calibration is all done within the device itself. And our ongoing work is on really trying to fine tune on how to um, do the necessary correlation so we validate the um, efficiency of our devices. Now, um, one of the things that um, we're really running into is obviously how to be able to repeatedly induce and also do long-term induction of sweating. And for this, we're playing with different formulations of the, the sticky pads that we're placing on the patients, and particularly with the gels with the agonist drugs, because there are different agonists that you can use, and there are also different, uh, what we call skin sensitizers, meaning things that will permit the agonist, the stimulating drug, to penetrate down to the glands without having to apply much current, because all this is based on electro, uh, iontophoresis, and that implies applying current to the skin. Um, now, since I'm running out of time, I'd just like to say that, obviously, you know, I haven't been doing this so long. I had the privilege of uh, being able to uh, collaborate with Paul and Jeff Wine here at Stanford for almost 10 years now, and Sam Emaminejad, who um, was here at Stanford and just took a faculty position at UCLA, but we're working very closely. And obviously, I have to thank all of my funding sources, but particularly to uh, CHRI. You know, they have faith on this, uh, what I call the outlandish idea, but I think it was called back then the new idea uh, grant <laughs> initiative. And thanks to that is that we could get some of the technology in place that allow us to do work that now everybody keeps calling us to get more information as to how we figure out these different things. Now, um, I know in the program it said something about Goldilocks and me, and I didn't know really what to say about Goldilocks, so this is the best I could come up with. But <laughs> thank you for your attention, and I'd love to hear your questions and comments. That, that was uh, sweatomics, did I get that right? Is that, yeah, that's the, the new field. So our, our last speaker, and I'll, I'll ask you again to, to hold your questions, but please remember them. Our last speaker is Bronwyn Harris. Bronwyn is an instructor in, in pediatrics here at Stanford. Uh, she got her uh, training uh, medical degree at Vanderbilt, then came to Stanford for pediatrics and pediatric cardiology. Uh, happy to say she was a biodesign fellow. And uh, she founded uh, a company called Tuyo Health. And uh, she'll talk maybe a little bit about that, but, but more importantly, about a different kind of uh, monitoring and different need for monitoring. Bronwyn, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Excited to be here and excited to talk about this topic, which, you know, we heard two great examples. And I'm actually even going to talk about sensors not specifically designed for medicine and really thinking through how can we use data from those and actually change clinical outcomes. And as Paul said, I'll give an example specifically in pediatric asthma from the startup company that we've started out of initial translational work here at Stanford. So with that, the disclosure that I am CEO and co-founder of Tuio, which I'll be talking about during this presentation. All right, so hands, who in this room has a smartphone? I won't, I won't ask the reverse of, of who doesn't, but I love that cell phone slide. So smartphone, who in here has a wearable that they're actually wearing? So an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or something else. So not as many, but still a fair amount. There's sleep sensors now, there's connected homes. So we have so much data from all different types of sources. Uh, there was a study or an article in Chess that I found from 2016 that was specifically looking at sleep apps and trackers. At that point, they counted over 80. I didn't bother trying to count you know, how many of those are still around and how many new ones, but it's a huge area and really is becoming part of our everyday lives. I love this quote here that 90% of the data in the world today has been generated in the past two years. Really staggering numbers. 
Now, the question is, though, what do we do with this data, and can we actually change clinical outcomes with that? So this is a quote from that same article that talked about how as sleep sensing is becoming ubiquitous, we await clinical trials to guide data-supported incorporation of these tools into patient care. Now, this quote, I would love to challenge everyone in here to not take this approach, to not just say, well, let's wait to be told what we can do with this, but to actually proactively think about what could this data be used for? And what would I need to actually change my practice and incorporate this data? So don't sit back and wait, work with the companies as we you know, hear great examples of, think about it and try to make that happen. Now, throwing out there too, the fact that this isn't easy. I love, love this quote, data don't give up their secrets easily, they must be tortured to confess. And I think this is particularly true with sleep sensors, wearable data, all of these, this data we're getting from different sources. It's out you know, in the real world, it's a lot less controlled than we're used to from medical devices. And so I'm not saying it's easy, but still let's, let's get there. How do we get there and what, what can we do for that? This is an example of a patient I saw while I was in my training uh, here at Stanford, so, you know, a Bay Area person. 42-year-old male came in, had no past medical history, no cardiac symptoms, but his sister had recently died from sudden cardiac death. So that's what he was being, coming to be seen to be evaluated. His echocardiogram was normal, so structure of his heart was normal. The EKG, a very short snapshot of his rhythm, was normal. And he's also a triathlete, so very fit, regularly does Ironman competitions, and then he also noted he wears a Fitbit. He wears it all the time when he's working out, when he's not, and commented he's never had inappropriately elevated heart rates. And it was interesting to hear that information and then to think through, is this useful? Do, should this change anything that I do? And I'd like all of you to think that, that if, if this were your patient, would you do something different? Is there a study or a test that you wouldn't order because of this? Does it change it at all? And if it doesn't, what would you need to have that have an effect. You know, do you need a printed report showing, you know, as opposed to someone just reporting this data? Do you need a study showing that this can accurately detect different concerning rhythms? So, you know, just interesting, this data is out there now and it is coming into clinic visits, as was mentioned earlier, you know, coming in with the genomic data or, you know, coming in with other information and thinking through, is this useful? And if not, what can we do to make it useful? And so the first thing that you really want to think through is a connection between the sensor data and then clinical measures. And you know, here's some examples of this. This is the Apple study that's going on right here at Stanford. And they're looking at how can you use data from the watch to show atrial, detect atrial fibrillation. AliveCore has done a similar study, published that in circulation. So again, looking at how do you take data from a sensor and then prove that it correlates with a clinical measure. Now, neither of those are yet showing outcomes, so aren't showing what do you do with that data, does that actually change clinical care, but an important first step. Now, the next thing that you need to do is really, okay, that's great, you can show clinical measures with that, but can you change outcomes? And is it different than what we have available now? Whether, you know, is it less costly, uh, you're able to get data more frequently, so you have additional insights. And so here I just put together a very simplified version of, you know, what I think of, how you take data from sensors, and again, I'm really thinking these are simple sensors. These aren't specifically made for a medical application. They're commercial off-the-shelf sensors. You then have specific data collected from it, and you need to show that there are insights, so clinical insights that you can get from that data. But then those insights also have to have an intervention that you can perform, because if you just have insights, but there's nothing you can do differently, that's not a value. But if you then have the intervention, and the intervention has to work, and I like the you know, examples of the psychology aspect, that if you have an intervention but no one does it, you're not going to have outcomes. So again, you need to really think through, there's an intervention that can be done based on those clinical insights, and it'll actually lead to improved outcomes. And so you know, multifactorial things you need to look at for that. On, you know, throw back to biodesign training and, you know, what Paul emphasizes is that start with an important clinical need. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't use the sensor to, you know, monitor all disease states and, you know, there are lots of applications, but pick one. Pick what you really feel like is the best one to be able to prove that out. And then you delve in and you really understand that need 
and make sure your solution is perfectly built for that. And so for anyone who isn't familiar with the biodesign process, I encourage you, you know, buy the textbook, uh, it's some light bedtime reading, or you know, take a class, uh, talk to Paul or anyone who's been through it. And, but just you know, throwing up the process here and looking, and you see that first third is talking about identifying. So really thinking through the clinical need, thinking through different options, because any need you're working on, there are you know, hundreds, thousands, even more other needs you're not working on. So, Pick very carefully what need you're working on, make sure you really understand it, and then you invent, then you make sure that your solution really fits that need, you get those outcomes, and then great, do it again. Do it again for another need and continue on. So I just wanna go through an example in pediatric asthma and show you how we took these steps and where we are today. Uh, and so Tuio Health is the startup company that we have started, and it's providing personalized AI-based asthma management. So just very brief background, so we're all on the same page about asthma. I'm sure everyone's heard of asthma. Now, typically, people don't know that much about it. All they know is exacerbations. And there's this misconception that exacerbations come out of nowhere and there's not much you can do about it. It's not true, and asthma management really is all about maintaining control and the goal of having patients not have symptoms. You know, not only not have exacerbations, but actually not have asthma be interrupting their daily lives. And there is the thought that every patient should be able to have their asthma controlled. Finding the right medications, identifying triggers, potentially needing to make changes in their homes or their environment so that they're not getting those triggers. There are three different levels of control. There's well-controlled, not well-controlled, and then very poor. Those are NIH guidelines of the three different categories, and there's only three because we don't have great measures of control. So unlike diabetes, where you could put numbers all along that scale, and you can know exactly where you stand, exactly when you, you know, kind of flip over from one section to another, you can know, you know how far you are from where your goal is. We don't have that in asthma. And the very poor control is essentially in an exacerbation but this not well-controlled state is a really interesting state and really important because you have the opportunity to make changes, whether it's getting patients on a different medication or getting them to take the medication that they had stopped taking um, or you know, identifying a trigger so that you can change that. And in that not well-controlled state, there's clear studies and data showing that you have an increased likelihood of needing to go to the emergency room or being hospitalized and increased health care expenditures. And the staggering numbers that 50% of both children or adults with asthma are not well controlled. There's 25 million Americans with asthma, 7 million of which are pediatric patients. And of the high healthcare expenditures, estimates that up to two thirds of them are preventable. So, you know, urgent care based, emergency room hospitalizations, that if that patient was able to have good control, those costs could be avoided. One of the big challenges with asthma is the fact that the control is primarily based on symptoms. And not just symptoms, but actually subjective recall of symptoms. So here's a validated questionnaire that is commonly used both in clinical studies and also in clinical practice and used as an assessment of control. And without, the, without objective standards of control, it often is overestimated. There is a subset of patients who actually don't perceive the symptoms, whether it's because they've been living with it for a long period of time. And this is particularly challenging with pediatric patients. You can imagine as an adult trying to monitor your young child for their symptoms or your adolescent child, you know, probably equally challenging, but to really know what's going on with them at that time. So asthma is a complex disease. However, when you break it down and you look here, there's, me there's drivers and then different signs, all of these things I have listed here are measurable. Uh, the, all of those drivers by different sorts of sensors and then these signs. Some of these signs I have listed there are part of the assessment of control. So night nighttime awakenings and cough frequency, those are part of the NIH guidelines. Now heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate are not actually anywhere in the guidelines. And while we monitor heart rate and respiratory rate in the hospital as you're recovering, um, there's also some you know, small studies we could find looking at methylcholine challenges when they induced asthma exacerbations, changes in that we needed to take that next step and prove that those could be used. So now those, all of that data that I'm showing here on the, the signs can be measured from sleep sensors and these off the shelf sleep sensors. The sensors are measuring small motions 
And based on an old principle, I didn't get back to 1600s, uh, that's about 100 years old reference of ballistocardiography, where there's characteristic vibration every time your heart beats. And so you can actually get beat to beat time just from these sleep sensors. And so again, back to this, all right, we need to show a connection from the data we can obtain from the sleep sensor and a clinical measure. And so we did an observational study here at Stanford with the wonderful pediatric pulmonary department and David Cornfield helping uh, lead the way. And we're able to show that we could put these sensors in children's homes, installed them all over the Bay Area, and the data that we get from these sleep sensors can correlate with asthma control. And then we also show that we could actually predict asthma symptoms, again, just based on the output of these sensors. And so that's great. Uh, that's wonderful that we can get those measures. But then the next step is, well, what do we do with that? What? So that's giving us insight, but how can we actually change outcomes? And so you know, we really had to think through, how is this different than what we're doing now? So you know, there are those surveys looking at symptoms, or there's medication trackers looking at symptoms. But this is something we can actually get on a daily basis. And so how does that change what we can do? How can we change the interventions? And so we created a solution where a full management program where we're collecting data every night while the child sleeps. We're also pulling in some environmental data so we can help identify potential triggers for each child. We use machine learning to have a baseline for each individual, so personalized, very important, particularly in pediatric patients, that you have it personalized. There's you know, a lot of variation, particularly in heart rate and respiratory rate. So we have a personalized baseline and then can look for trends and changes in that when there's significant deviation. And we can alert the family, use it as an engagement tool to get additional context, find out what's going on with them, find out if they're taking their medications at that period of time, ask about triggers. And then we also have an asthma educator who you know, is, is somewhat of a safety net, so ability to, when there's problems or questions that the families can't get from automated education, they can reach out and talk to an asthma educator. So again, as we're thinking through all of the different interventions, we looked at what's out there and how can we do it differently. Education has been shown time and time again to make a big difference. However, there's very low engagement. And so what we found is by having this daily score and alerts, we, it's extremely engaging to the family. And they are able to then get education and guidance at the point in time when something's changing. Similar home visits can make a big difference identifying triggers, but it's hard to know when something's going on, who needs that help and when. So we can again do that through the tracking, through the device, through the alerts and through the answers that the families are giving us and able to just virtually have an asthma coach work with the families at a point in time when they're really ready to make significant changes. And so here's an example screenshot from our app showing on a particular patient that there's been a large change in the data that we're collecting. And then they go through a series of questions where they let us know, is there something else going on? Because there could be something non-asthma affecting uh, these parameters that we're measuring. If it is asthma, we collect the symptoms and the severity and then ask personalized questions based on that and then give targeted timely education. And here's an example, this is actually my daughter, uh, who's been being tracked now for the past year and a half uh, with her asthma, and she's well controlled, so she doesn't have an alert right now, and it's wonderful to be able to look at this and see that there aren't significant changes. I can share this information when I go in for the doctor's visit, you know, can work with a pulmonologist, look at her trends over time, look at the data, and have her symptoms well tracked. And in her case, cons consider decreasing the controller medication, making sure that we're on the minimum amount, but enough to keep her well controlled. And then, so great, we made this intervention, we understood this clinical need, but now we need to prove it. And so we're actually just completing our randomized clinical study, 260 patients, 16 week, 130 in the intervention arm and 130 in the control arm. Um, and, you know, we'll be excited in a few weeks to release the official results of that. But in the meantime, I'll just take you through one of the patients who uh, had a wonderful experience with the study. He, prior to coming into the study, had had an exacerbation about every month, had been in the emergency room twice in the prior year, and one hospitalization. When he started using the service, actually in the first week, he had an alert, 
had a significant change. The mom actually reported she didn't notice anything different. She then messaged us that evening to say, wow, this noticed something I didn't notice. She got called by school and her son had a high fever and two days later he started having asthma symptoms. So we actually often see that with viruses and triggers that we'll see changes before the symptoms are actually realized. So the mom was on board with the fact that this data can be powerful and she was engaged and you know, willing to make changes based on that. So in December, when she was having more alerts and was noticing symptoms, the asthma coach was able to work with her and help move her from a place where she thought her son was on too many medications and didn't understand that he wasn't well controlled to realizing he's not well controlled, he should be well controlled, that is the goal, got him on all of the medications that had already been prescribed, so it wasn't actually changing it, it was just getting mom on board with the actual plan. And also looking through her home and identifying triggers, they found some mold that they were able to have removed. And in January, he was completely well controlled with no symptoms at all. Uh, so the mom was very happy with this service. It really helped educate her about asthma. She was a lot more involved and felt a lot more empowered about her child's care. Um, she requested not to send the device back. So we actually have allowed patients who, as families requested, they are in a beta program to continue using it. So we'll get to see their longer term results. So, you, you know, I think really exciting right now this period in time with all of these sensors and all of this data out there, everything that's going on in the tech world, again, that you know, cell phone uh, shots is, are perfect, showing all of that changes. There's also changes in healthcare. Chronic diseases are a big problem. There's value-based care. Um, we're really shifting care into the home and trying to see you know, how can we change that? But we need to put those together. And you know, I think that this is an exciting time to do all of that. And I encourage everyone to really, again, think through, don't just wait to be told, oh, okay, you can use this sensor and now you can change your care in this way. Think through, how could this data be valuable? What do I need to have this actually affect care? How would I want it provided to me? You know, what would be useful? And then you know, find someone, whether you do that yourself or find industry or someone else that can help you move that forward. Uh, you know, even with what we're doing right now, we're not stopping with asthma. There, you know, the thoughts are that other chronic diseases that don't have good measures of control may also be able to benefit from this type of passive monitoring that you can use as an engagement and then help provide interventions from that. And there's lots of other sensors that we can pull in, including you know, in-home sensors, understanding more about the in-home environment, particularly for asthma, where that can really make significant changes. And you know, that, so that, that concludes it. And I would, you know, just my little plug for pediatrics also is that you know, making sure that we don't have pediatrics as an afterthought, that when you're innovating, sometimes it makes sense to start with adults and then you know, modify it for pediatrics. But in our case, we were able to think through it and actually made sense to start with pediatrics. They have less comorbidities. I mean, my, an adult with a chronic disease, 60% have a second one. And so the data can get a bit more complicated sorting through that. You also have a very passionate audience. Uh, we found that working with pediatric asthma patients and their families has been a great place for us to start. Thank you. Thanks, Bronwyn. <laughs> All right, we have a few minutes for discussion, and what I'm hoping, uh, are, I don't know if there are microphones in the audience. Is that true? Yes, great. Um, so what a great range of, of talks. I'm, I'm winding up optimistic about <laughs> the, the progress that's being made in, in uh, digital. And uh, let's uh, please uh, open up for, for uh, questions. Uh, anybody want to start? If, uh, okay. Um, so uh, we, we've also got uh, questions coming up here. I'll read this one out, and uh, maybe David will, will direct this to you. The cost of closed loop uh, and, and some of the other systems, uh, let, let's start with diabetes. Are they going to be covered by insurance, and uh, will adults and children have equal access? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, the first step is these systems have to exist. So that's our goal to have equal and access. And those are reimbursed, is that? Yes, yes. Now, um, you know, each plan is different, um, and that can be can be a challenge. Um, so it, clearly, we need to have 
these help a broad range of people um, and not just uh, a, a certain segment who can afford it, but we need to get this technology and this access um, to people, not only across the US, but across the globe as well. Great. So another question about challenges, and, and uh, Bronwyn, it makes me think of, of you. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're launching a whole new paradigm here. Yeah. What, what are what are you worried about, or what are the what are yeah. the roadblocks? <laughs> oh, well, where to start? No, I, I think the biggest thing is the getting paid and the market and how you know while there is a shift to value based care and and you know everyone pretty much believes there should be it's somewhat slow coming and so when you're innovating something that is meant to take cost out of the system but at the same time takes you know money away from fee from service hospital organizations and systems that there is that challenge of where is that going to come from how does that adoption happen uh, you know even the direction and timing you do that we chose to do the clinical study first so we felt that was really important but then you know the question is well the market how much revenue do you have yet you know why don't you have this much revenue to prove then that you can get to the next stage so and i think it, you know as you alluded earlier paul of digital health that there have been some in the past that haven't panned out and so there's a bit you know of a question of the clinical validity, but then also ones that have panned out, but have been struggling or taking a lot longer than people expected to get paid for. So really I'd say market and getting it paid for is the biggest. That makes sense. Um, uh, Carlos, I'll, I'll, what's your biggest worry about the uh, sweat-based technologies moving, moving forward into really practical clinical application? Yeah, I, I'll say, you know, years back, I would have said it's the funding and the financials, but now we have sweatomics, so <laughs> it's really exploded. Everybody has an interest. Um, I think it's more the regulatory side of things, you know, how these are going to be regulated. Are they going to be seen more as a lab test or are they going to be seen more as a device? I, I don't think the FDA is there yet when it comes to who's going to regulate this. Because I, I can tell you, I dragged my feet for the longest time about doing my own sweat lab. Mm. Uh, in part because, well, it have to come under CLIA, and I don't even want to start thinking what it will take to get it certified for that. Um, so I think that's sort of the next mountain that we're going to have to climb. You know, how we get regulators to come to an agreement as to, you know, how these things are going to be seen so we can move to the next level. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I think what is happening is, you know, the, the, it's one of these where the field is going to start moving ahead of us. You know, the, I won't be surprised if pretty soon we see an iWatch that has a sweat sensor on it. Um, and, and there are a lot of different devices I've seen where people are trying to exploit either using a sweat for glucose monitoring, for example. But I think, you know, there's still very limited understanding as to what the measurement really means. So we may see a lot of bad stuff out there that will give a bad name to sweatomics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't do it right. This reminds me of a question I was going to ask uh, for, for all of you, really. So, so the tech companies like Apple and uh, others are moving into health, there are, there are startups, there are the university-based programs. But do you have a general feeling about, I'll start with you, David, how, how the dynamic is going uh, there? Do, do you see the tech companies actually ultimately dominating the health sensing market? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting uh, question. And, uh, you know, I think it remains to be seen where it's going to go. We do have a adjunct faculty member had been full time on faculty and now works with Apple as an innovator. Um, so um, we know we, they've got some very good people that are working on this. Um, I think from the concept of uh, consumer devices that companies like Apple do a very good job with that. And some of the devices that we currently have, the diabetes technology is a little clunky. So I think that that can um, certainly help that uh, make that better. Uh, we'll see whether they come out with their own systems or do they just have technology that then gets placed into these other devices. So, so there's a great question on the screen that we'll finish with, which is, uh, is everything going to come together into one tech? Are, are we going to be, you know, wearing a watch that, that does everything? So, so uh, give us a prediction here, and we'll, we'll just run. Bron Bronwyn, what does this look like 20 years from now? <laughs> yeah, interesting question. Uh, high wearables I don't love as much. I've gotten a bit biased towards, but monitoring you can do at sleep when you have a lot 
less confounding variables that, you know, you don't have to get all of the other additional context. Um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of value in that. We've had more trouble sorting out and figuring out from the wearable devices. But then the other question of kind of will 20 years down the road, I think it could be that you can use data from these consumer devices and whether it's even, you know, as screening and, you know, part of your yearly checkup, do you, you know, review your device data? And it's pretty amazing the changes that we see. And even in our, the children with asthma from other things, you know, when we're seeing an alert, if it's not asthma, it's something, you know, a child had a surgery yeah. and, you know, was in a lot of pain and not sleeping as well. Like, so th there's a lot that you can see from this data, but it's a big challenge of what is it useful? How do you sort through it? How do you, you know, not kind of cause people to be worried about things when they don't need to. So I'm not sure what it, what it looks like. And I'm not sure that it would be, that it'll be a wearable. Um, but I do think we will be using data or looking at data from commercial devices as part of medical care. 20 years from now, routinely. So, so very quick answer, Carlos, and we'll give you final word because we're, we're running out of time. So is it all sweat or uh, what? what? <laughs> no, I think, you know, the, if anything, we just need to catch up with the technology, you know, because you could argue the next wearable is really going to be an implantable and then you can get everything you want. <laughs> uh, the technology is there. You know, I think we need to start looking outside of our own box and establishing the right levels of partnerships, being it you know, big industry or big pharma. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what is gonna lead to, you know, I think not just the best type of applications or devices, but also um, what is gonna uh, give us the most uh, productive type of data. Because at, at the end of the day, it's what use we make of the data. Right. Well, we're gonna have Heidi and Dave, uh, David come up here and, and summarize again, but please join me in thanking this uh, panel for a terrific Thank job. You. Thank you.